All right, so I just got out of Star Wars Episode Nine, Midnight Screening, and it's not as bad as it could have been. Like, uh, like there's a lot about this movie that prevents me from saying it's good. And there's a... I mean, honestly, this entire... This entire trilogy, sequel trilogy has been a fumble. And... Now, I will say I think part of the reason I'm not as disappointed as I feared I might be is... Or, you know, as angry as I thought I might be is that I did hear a lot of the leaks and spoilers. There's... Which are true. The majority of them are true. And so... I was a little bit prepared for such things to happen. But still, there's just a lot of things I have issues with in this movie. And yeah, to be fair to J.J. Abrams and kind of everyone else involved in this movie, a lot of the problems with this film are that they kind of have to clean up after Last Jedi. And not necessarily for the reasons... Yeah, well, yeah. They have to clean up for one reason or another, for, or in one way or another. Now... Uh, I guess probably one prevalent thing should probably be addressed is how do they handle well Princess Leia and you know, I mean I never expected anything great because I mean you know, Carrie Fisher of course passed away before this movie went into production so and they were stuck to using old unused footage and I th want to say some re-edited or some reused uh, dialogue, I'd wager. But, uh, yeah. So I can't, I can't really blame them um, for how it turns out, but I didn't. Yeah, unfortunately, because of that, it's a lot of, especially the earliest on interaction between Ray and Leia, the dialogue just feels kind of clunky. But again, they were kind of limited to clunky. And then... But yeah. No, but otherwise, I think... I think they handled it fairly well. Well, as well as it can be done. And so... Uh, as for the movie as a whole... The movie as a whole is honestly kind of clunky. And it has very much some bad pacing issues. Because, like, you know, the, the very opening... There's so many times that where it just feels like you're just jumping from one place, one scene to another. Or in some scenes don't even need to exist. Like, you know, and they introduce a bunch of new characters that... The most of which, honestly, I don't think really need to exist. It's like, I mean, that doesn't say they don't serve some purpose, but it is something where I feel like they could easily have written some other way around it. So, uh, and I mean, one thing's for certain, this is not... 
This is not the note Star Wars, the main saga of Star Wars, should have gone out on. And, yeah, honestly, without, you know, without going into spoilers, if you for some reason haven't known about, have managed to avoid them, or, you know, you actually care enough to avoid them, It's just not... <sighs> no, the, the ending happens and I just kind of feel... Honestly, I don't feel angry or anything. I just kind of feel empty, which I feel like is even worse of a feeling. Because Disney has done the one thing I didn't think possible and made me not really care. Well, I mean, I might care once I start watching Mandalorian because I've heard that's really good. So there is hope. Just not for this trilogy. They, uh, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I disown this trilogy. Stick to the old EU books. They're so much better. I even... Hmm, kind of... I guess you could say they're campiest. They're still better than this. Because there's... They were done with... They were done by people who you had the feeling actually cared about the franchise. Who enjoyed playing in the world of Star Wars. Meanwhile... Well, Disney just sees it as a cash grab opportunity. I know. Um, man, what else can I say without just going full on into spoilers? I mean, I guess... I mean, I guess I can talk about Palpatine, because they haven't really hidden his appearance. And they don't hide his appearance in the movie, either. Literally, the first uh, sentence of the opening scrawl is, Palpatine's back. It's like, wow, we're not, we're not even building up to this or anything. We're just, yeah, he's back. I can, so it's like... But they... What? It, it feels so out of left field. A lot of things in this feel kind of out of left field. It's just... Honestly, unless you've been living under, I will say, like, you know, there are some supposed plot twists in this, but I mean, unless you've been living under a rock for the past, what would it be now, nine, or, well, no, not, not nine, five years, here's, I'd say, you've probably, you know, there's nothing in this that will actually surprise you. wise like if you you know you stuck through if you really want to stick through it to the end like I I did you can see it it's not like I wouldn't say it's to the terms of horrible 
and I'm like, it's completely unwatchable, but then again, I'm, I do, uh, I do have a tendency to like, like bad movies and be kind of forgiving, but it's like, but I mean, it's not something I'd be, i like, yeah, you should be rushing out of your house to go see this as soon as possible. from here yeah that's it for that I guess we're gonna go into spoilers so we're gonna even begin with that honestly this movie makes this movie honestly kind of makes Last Jedi even worse of a film because there are things that are you know brought up about Last Jedi that they bring up, up that this movie now has to address to see oh we can't do this because like was it one guy you know, when they're going to attack the main fleet of the Star Destroyers is like like we'll just pull a hold home remover or one of them has someone else has to correct him and go no that was a one in a million chance and so it was like like oh yeah g glad we addressed that and then there's another thing that really irked me but I'm gonna have to bring that up later but yeah they, it all begins with you know, apparently, I guess Palpatine's been sending out radio signals throughout the galaxy now to let them know he's back. O okay. And so Kylo goes searching Inc. for her them because he sees Palpatine as a threat to his position as Supreme Leader of the First Order, which honestly kind of gets kind of gets a little bit forgotten like halfway through the movie. Yeah, so... You know, he... You know, literally... This is like the first five minutes of the movie. He, he find, uh, finds the hidden map to where, River Pal, to where Palpatine is. Is it... Goes there, confronts Palpatine. It's revealed uh, Snoke was... In fact, a clone... I don't know if he was a clone of Palpatine, but it was a clone, at least a clone of something. And you even see, you know, like, two torsos of him in, like, an embryo jar, jar essentially. A very large jar. And, and then, and Kylo meets Palpatine. Who is absent a significant amount of makeup. Stop this here for a moment. So, Kyron goes, finds Palpatine, who doesn't have any makeup on. Or, yeah. he does, but he doesn't have the Emperor makeup on. I mean, he's pale, his lips are kind of, I mean, the lighting, they look kind of blackish, I'm guessing and he's wearing contacts so his eyes look blind but he otherwise it's just Ian McDermott and I'm like why why does he not have any makeup on it's it's very odd it's an odd decision but then later in the film he actually gets restored and he turns into the proper emperor with the wrinkles and everything and it's like Shouldn't his restored version be Ian McDermott, though? And then his old version be the Emperor? Yeah, I, I, I don't get it. But, yeah, 
Palpatine is back. He offers Kylo who his fleet of the Star Destroyers in return if he bring he kills Rey. And then we jump to Poe and Finn Poe Finn Chewie was was BB eight? No, BB eight was not with them. And then and they go learn there's a spy in the first order trying to contact them. Um and jump out. And now that now because Typho they can be tracked through hyperspace. They say now do a oh what did they call it? They basically go through like multiple hyperspace jumps, humps one after another. Or Poe, a witch doing it like it, like jumps basically like out of atmosphere and into you know, atmosphere here in these very close, close range. Most distances to like buildings and spires and planets and stuff, and it's like that. And it's like that shouldn't be possible though, because Poe doesn't. Because uh, I believe Anakin does it once in the Clone Wars, which he can pull off because, as he's a great pilot and he has the Force. Whereas Han pulled it off in Force Awakens. Ends, but even that was built up as like a giant risk. But now here Poe's doing it like almost effortlessly. It's like, like, w w what? He just took the risk out of everything previously. So I'm not a fan of that. And then we, as they're doing that, excuse me, we cut to Ray, who is. Is uh, training Hang in the Jedi ways. He's being taught by Leia. And then see she and Kylo share a, another Force of Vision-y thing. And then. What happened? Uh, what did happen after that? I can't remember. It's all. It's like that's how many se scenes get crammed into like that first several minutes. It's. And then. something about, about Kylo searching for the Emperor, and so they, they go to find the, the second of only two maps, maps that would also lead them to the Emperor so they can stop him, and, and they... they go to the planet and they, they actually meet up with Lando oh, on there, because he's just traveling along by, I guess. As he points them in the right direction, because conveniently, he uh, they were led there by Luke's notes, because he was looking for the planet Palpatine's on. And conveniently, Lando went with him to this particular planet in search of it. And, and tells them where their trail ended. And then the First Order her finds them. And we... They're apparently surprised by the fact that jet troopers exist. 
even though troopers wearing jetpacks have existed since the Clone Wars, even before the Clone Wars, depending on how much is still canon or not. So, that's a scene that happens, and it's painful. And then, so, that happens. Since they escape the troopers, but land in quicksand, which, and they all sink into a series of tunnels where there's this giant snake thing, which I'll admit has a cool design to it. Then they learn the snake's hostile because it's injured, and so Ray now has the magic ability of healing hands. Yes. Then... What exactly was it she said? It was like... It's like you're given... Some of... I don't know, it kind of builds it up like hey, you're giving some of your health to heal them. I think and that's set up for later. So... Uh, in the caves, they find it. Find this this dagger that has the instructions to who the planet written on it. And then and three three PO C three PO can and read it, but he is not his programming prevents him from translating it. And so they, they then try to leave. He Ray goes to confront Kylo Ren. And meanwhile, Chewie gets captured and they they and then so while Ray and Kylo Ren are fighting the shuttle, Chewie he is is supposedly on it. Is taking off, so Ray tries to do a Star Killer and force grab it and force it back to the ground. And Kylo does, I guess, similar to try and release it. Ray somehow accidentally fires force lightning that that destroys the shuttle. And yeah, they uh, fake out Chewie's death. Yeah, that was fun. It's like. That was a fun few minutes. It was like, really? That's how you're going to kill him off? But no. Now it's revealed there was a second shuttle. Which I think, actually, to be fair, I think we do see when they're capturing Chewie. But we only see the one taking off. Where the other one mysteriously disappeared to, I don't exactly... Well, I mean, we see where it goes, but how it disappeared, I'm not sure. But yes, so, uh, Chewie gets captured, heard along with the dagger, her, and so, now the only copy of the information is in 3PO's memory, and so they take him to another planet, so that they can meet a, I believe they said a droid smith. Yeah, like underground black market droid smith who can and get the information out of his brain and then while they're there we meet the bounty hunter Zordy Bliss I'm pretty sure her last name is Bliss but yeah and yeah she's one of the characters who did not need to exist because she acts as this, you know, his, as part of Poe's history, which is suddenly prevalent and unimportant, and as well as kind of a love interest, which feels odd, because like, okay, this is an odd place to be putting this, and so, yeah, so when they... 
hey, first meet, they're in conflict because I guess Poe left the gang they were in, and so he's wanted dead. And, but then Ray beats, beats all the gang members up, so Zori helps them. It's like, well, that felt like a very unnecessary conflict. You'll find a lot of that stuff in this. So, the gun of the droid smith. If uh, he accesses C-3PO's memory, but at the downside, it will cause a complete memory wipe of 3PO. Oh, and... And, oh no, he doesn't have his... His data backed up anywhere. Spoilers, R2 has his data backed up on him. Even though they try to tell you, like, no. It's like, oh, no, R2 servers are not reliable. It's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, no, he has it. And so, yeah. We spend a few minutes with 3PO not knowing who anyone is. Is or what's going on. And they get the information which leads them to Endor. And so, uh, they then and find out Chewie is alive and on the First Order ship, so they go to rescue him. And, and then, while they're there, they learn, learn that General Hux is actually the spy, and then Hux later gets killed. Pretty, un, pretty, pretty much like immediately. <laughs> Because they now have a this new commander, uh, Admiral Pride, I guess was old Imperial, and served under the Emperor and is still working for him, kind of in secret. So, oh uh, yeah, he basically immediately he calls Hux out, out and kills him, and so yeah. Yeah, glad we spent two movies with that character. And then, you know, while they're, while Poe, Finn, and, you know, while Poe and Finn are helping Chewie, he, he, Ray, confronts Kylo again. And then Kylo reveals that Ray is a Palpatine. Which would not be a surprise to anyone who has been around for the past, like, four, five years. Because pretty much very early on, on probably, like, the two most popular theories about, about Rey's identity was that she's either a Skywalker or she's a Palpatine. Oh, look, she's a Palpatine. Yeah, we're, we're so surprised by this. Yes, so she's Emperor Palpatine's granddaughter. Her, because his son and then his wife fit. They flipped to hide her. You know, where the, you know, where Palpatine got his son from, it's never revealed. <laughs> They're kind of just made up as they go. And then, what else? But yes, that happens. They escape. So, where would they go then? Yeah, they, they then go to Endor, or Crash Land. The dagger is conveniently shaped, like part, you know, to fit kind of like a puzzle piece on part of the wreck, wreckage visually. Hey, and it has a little compass sort of thing to point where where the map is, which conveniently points to the Emperor's throne room. I, I feel like there is a simpler way to do that, especially with such an iconic location, um, which also I feel like kind of begs the question of did was the dagger made before or after the Death Star crash? 
because when we first find it, you kind of get, it almost feels like, well, actually, no, I guess we're going to technically have to be afterwards. I don't know, zero. It tries to be kind of Indiana Jonesy, but it fails. Because, <laughs> yeah, just, you kind of just feel like your head's, scr- your head's spinning, trying to figure all this out. And then, what else? Uh, so, Ray goes to the throne room. They play Darth Vader's, uh, his, uh, Death's Death music, which, uh, I don't know, it's not, not like I, that I don't like the mu- music, it's just, I feel like the Emperor's theme would have been a bit more appropriate, considering it was his throne room. And yes, and then, while Ray's there, here she finds a supposed secret room, but I call it into question because I... Actually, I'd have to take a look at the Emperor's his throne room from outside to know for certain. It's like, I don't, I don't know, it's put up against a wall where I'm like, I don't feel like the wall should be that deep from the outside. But then again, there's also force vision and stuff, so, yeah. And yeah, she finds, finds the map and is also confronted by a vision of her, her evil self. They have a very, very poorly edited fight. Very poorly shot and edited fight. Hey, I mean, it's literally just cuts and flashes. Like you can't make sense of just about anything. And Ray gets out, but Kylo's there. He gets the map and destroys it. It and they proceed to have a fight. Fight where Kylo is actually shown to be competent. And Actually, towards the end of it, Kylo is about to win. But then, Leia uh, uses the last of her energy to reach out to him, sort of similar to how Luke did, which distracts him and allows Rey to stab him, which she then uses her healing powers to heal. Heal and leaves, takes Kylo's ship, leaving him there her to ponder things. So, you would think Rey's going to confront the Emperor. No, she's going to... What was the planet's name from The Last Jedi? Octo. She goes there to the same island, burns the ship, tries to destroy Luke's lightsaber. Her... Then uh, Luke's Force Ghost catches it. It and, you know, gives her a talking to. That kind of the very same talking points we got in Last Jedi. So, kind of repeating that, that plot point. And then. And. Kind of basically just convinces her, like, yeah, you need to confront the Emperor. And then... I I mentions that, yeah, he knew she was a Palpatine. Leia knew she was a Palpatine. And and then we get a, a flashback to Luke and Leia training with the lightsabers. There's... Because Leia has a, her own lightsaber, which it, it's an alright design. Mm, yeah, we got a force flashback to that where we actually see digitally restored young Luke and digitally restored young Leia. And I, I, I will say the effects on young Luke look a little bit better than the effects on young Leia. I don't know. If, I don't know, something, something about it just seemed a little odd. And it, it, might, it might have been because they were wearing, like, the training helmets thing, but 
And it just looked like her face was a little long. I think with that, I suppose that could be just the helmets like cutting off of part of your vision of them. Yeah, it, not it's revealed that uh, what was it? She said like something Jedi, something will lead to the death of her son. So I don't, I don't know if this flashback takes place before or after Ben has been born. And yeah, yeah, that's wonderfully confusing. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Kylo's ship, which Ray took to Octo, has been burned. So how does she get to face the Emperor? She uses Luke's X-wing. That Luke lifts out of the water. Which brings up the question of why didn't he just go to the planet in episode 8? <sighs> Problems with this movie. Honestly, I'm kind of glad I ended up, <laughs> up procrastinating and stalling my episode 8 hate review because oh the things this movie now allows me to add this complaints this movie now allows me to add onto it it now it's horrible it doesn't make sense okay it's not horrible is both the wrong word and the right word for different contexts and circumstances but anyway, uh, so let's see, that happens, and we then cut back to Kylo on Endor, who is visited by, you know, by the, his own memory of Han Solo. So yeah, Harrison Ford's back, yay! And... Yeah, they have a very nice, touching scene. I mean, I really enjoyed it. It, uh... I have a, I have a pretty good feeling... Like, knowing... I mean, it's not a secret that Harrison Ford... Has wanted out of playing Han Solo, but I think... I'm wagering... What was going to happen was that this was originally meant to be sort of... This was a scene originally meant for Leia... Then she passed, and I'm guessing, yeah, being Harrison, you know, out, agreed to it out of respect for Carrie. Either something along those lines is why I wagered how it went down. But, yeah. So, that happens. Uh, they sort of repeat some of their dialogue from episode 7 on the bridge. And this time, Kylo throws his lightsaber away. And... Let's see what happens. So, Rey, who now has Kylo's map from his TIE fighter, her goes to confront the Emperor and basically kind of charts a path to the planet so that the rest of the Resistance can follow her. Or, or the resistance leave it. You even go after them. M. Ray gets to the planet, confronts Palpatine, and it's revealed there's like this entire Sith cult on the planet. It, which honestly is actually kind of cool. Like, this is the kind of stuff I want to have in Star Wars movie, was more of this like Sith temples and Sith cults and stuff like that. But then Palpatine says, speaks to her and says that all the Sith live in him and once she strikes him down in anger, his soul will transfer into her and then she will be all of the Sith. Which is a new lore piece that I have, 
I feel like I made up just for this movie. Because I do not recall anything of that in that in any of the Star Wars lore I know. And then that happens. The Resistance gets to the planet, starts fighting the Star Destroyers. There's and then can't remember when exactly, but at some point, like Kylo gets to the planet using a, I guess he managed to find a Tie Fighter that wasn't destroyed, hid inside of the ruins of the Death Star, and so he goes in to help Ray. Hey, Palpatine continues to try to tempt her to kill him. Him using much of the same techniques that he did with Luke and you know, Snoke did with her in episodes 6 and 8, respectively. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And then... Where was I going with this? There you go. So yeah, uh, while the Resistance is fighting, Lando and Chewie are going around with the Falcon, trying to gather her more support. Or, it's, you know, at some point, I think they arrive. I have, because, you know, now, suddenly, they answer the call. And then, let's see, Kylo gets into the temple, is confronted by the Knights of Ren, and, and, you guys probably should have brought this up, but throughout the movie, Rey and Kylo have been having sort of force, like the force visioning interactions things they had in episode 8, and it's been revealed they can actually sort of pass objects to one another, or, or through time and space to each other, or... So, Ray they, uh, teleports her lightsaber, Luke's lightsaber, to Kylo, who then uses it to fight off the Knights of Ren. And pretty well, I'd say. Once again, I think Kylo, or I think uh, Adam Driver is the better lightsaber performer of the two. And then Ray takes out Leia's lightsaber to confront the Emperor. And then <laughs> let's see. And Kylo manages to make his way into Ray. Hey, the Emperor just basically force holds them, reveal, and learns that he can. Their uh, what was it called? I think it was like called a diode in the force. And so, they're, something, something, he can absorb like their life essence to restore himself. And that's the point I brought up earlier, where it's like, he was just, it's like he doesn't have like the full Emperor makeup, but then he restores himself and suddenly has the full Emperor makeup, which kind of feels like it should be reversed. Yeah. And then... And so... That happens... And see then... At that point... And shoots lightning into the sky... And basically disables all the resistance ships. And then... Let's see, I think Kylo... Yeah, Kylo gets up first... Ember just force pushes him into a hole. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait to respect the characters. There's, and then Ray is kind of just left staring there up in the sky and then calling upon the ghosts of the Jedi past to help her. Then we get a bunch of a lot of little bits of dialogue, like from past Jedi, 
Hey, right, okay, uh, we got... But, uh, I'm pretty sure Ewan McGregor, Hayden Christensen, Yoda, Sam Jackson. Um, they might have used a, a line from a reworked line from Al Guinness. I'm not certain though. But yeah, she basically calls upon the ghosts of the Jedi to help her. And then, and she gets up, faces Palpatine, who shoots her with lightning. She blocks it with lightsaber. Then she calls Luke's lightsaber, and now she's walking with two lightsabers. So, and then she eventually pushes it back to the point the lightning's reflecting back at him, um, and it essentially vaporizes him. And... Yeah, that's mostly it. <laughs> yeah, that's our final battle. And so, that happens. The Resistance ends up destroying the fleet. He, Kylo pulls himself out of the hole, hole and finds Rey hey, dead, and then uses basically the last of his force energy he, um, or, no, not force energy, the last of his life, essentially, to bring her back to life. And then they kiss. <sighs> I, I got, I'm, if it had been done in a different movie, in a different trilogy of stories, it I might have been okay with it, but in this one, I'm less like, you know, if we're crying out loud, just, just get it over with. And then, he dies, fades away into the Force. I just realized, we, as we got to the end, and we didn't, well, I just, uh, never mind. <laughs> but, yeah. So, yeah. Now the entire Skywalker family is dead. It's also a little awkward because the entire movie Finn is also the kiss is a little bit awkward because in the entire movie Finn is I'm pretty sure <laughs> trying to tell Ray he loves her, but he keeps getting cut off. Off and yeah, they never have that moment. So it's kind of like yeah, again a thing where it's like. Why is that a thing? Does that really need to be a thing? If we're not going to do it anyway? Yeah. They all make it out. Uh, celebrations happen. We get, for some reason, CGI Ewoks. Which... Don't honestly look that good. <laughs> and then... Yeah, we see some, some planets we see. And then the movie ends with Rey going to Tatooine to the Lars farm. Yeah, the Lars farm. Or she, he buries uh, Luke and Leia's lightsaber and then... This old woman who is just there, ask her who she is, is and she says she's Ray Skywalker. And yeah, that's the rise of Skywalker. All right, all right I won't say it's like it's not. It's not a horrible. This is it's like. I don't know, I have my own issues that might flush out in a more extensive review, even though this is going on 50 minutes. And so, oh, the scene, and so the movie ends with the, basically the poster for Force Awakens, ends of Ray 
Higgin BB-8 kind of walking into a twin sunset. Which I guess that means BB-8's now raised droid. I, I don't know. Like, that's what Force Awakens built us up to believe. But then it's like, oh, no, BB-8 is Poe's droid. And we kind of just kept that in Episode Eight, And we kind of keep that here. Except for suddenly at the end, I guess he's Ray's droid. I don't know. I don't know. It's one of the many things that do not make sense. But, yep. Yeah, that's basically the movie. It's it's rushed, clunky. It feels like it feels like it's trying to cram more than one movie. He, it feels like it's this one movie is trying to be in and of itself a trilogy. Because, like I said. It just starts off with, yeah, the Emperor's back, and it's like, it's like this doesn't feel like a part three, this feels like a part one. But then by the end, it's kind of like, yeah, that's the end, I guess. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just lost and confused and sad. I, I, I don't know, I just, I, I feel like I need, on the one hand, I feel like I need time and possibly more viewings to fully process my thoughts on this, but in all honesty, I'm like, I don't, I don't really want to watch this again. I just, like, at this point, after the whole last Jedi debacle and now this, I'm like, like, you know, it's done with. Let's just, can we just please forget this trilogy exists? It was a mistake. A poorly thought out mistake. Mm, so, yeah, I'm... Um, So, yeah, my thoughts like I'm I'm not furious, but I'm greatly unimpressed overall. I'd say. Here's hoping Mandalorian's good. And ends on a good note. 